Okay, so my name is Gianna Cleese Caldwell. I'm a cheesemaker. I uh, grew up milking cows and making yogurt and um, selling raw milk. And uh, my husband and I started a little creamery in 2005 with goat milk. So I work with lots of different kinds of milk. I have a few books out on cheese and dairying. And in this class today, you're going to learn how to make the most basic and simple and wonderful type of cheese. Uh, it's in the category of heated milk with added acid which is a big group of cheeses, and we're gonna learn how to make two or three of them here today. Everything that you're gonna learn in this class and everything you need, you can pick up on the way home and make the cheese tonight. So that's my goal, that you have no more, no excuses to not make cheese. Yeah, yeah. So I call this quick and simple three in one. It's the basis for learning that every cheese is related to another cheese, and they all start out really similar. So from this basis, you'll be able to make a lot of different things. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's, it's worth a trumpet call. All right. So one of the types of cheeses in this family is what we all know as ricotta. Ricotta goes by other names throughout the world, but for today, we'll call it ricotta. Ricotta can be a loose cheese that you use in uh, lasagna and other dishes, or you can form it in little baskets and make it into a cheese that will stand alone. You can see this picture here. I've topped this with some roasted red peppers and Kalamata olives and basil. Um, these cheeses, while simple to make, are easy to impress with. And that's part of the fun. When I first made my first cheeses at home, I was just, it was like magic. And you think uh, you've make, created some sort of a miracle and you just want to invite people over and share it. The next type that we'll make with this is um, a staple at our farm. We have interns that we have to feed. It is a paneer style. If any of you have heard that term, it's an Indian name for a cheese that's just the, what we're going to do today, but then pressed. It's a cheese you can grill, you can fry, it doesn't melt, and it is very versatile. And it's, it takes less than an hour to make. And you can freeze it also. Um, usually at the end of a smaller class of this type, we fry it up and eat it. And, you know, what's better than fried cheese? And then you can take the fluffy type and you can use it to make uh, some little lovely ricotta balls that I did here, dusted with pistachio, and then drizzled with maple syrup and uh, roasted grapes. Simple, fun, satisfying. This is all you need. You need a pot, you need some milk, any type of milk will do. We're using grocery store milk today. You can use raw goat milk, raw sheep milk, raw cow milk, any kind of milk, as long as it tastes good as it is. If it doesn't taste good as it is, don't make it into cheese. It's not gonna make it any better. We're going to use lemon juice, lemon juice today as our acid source. You can use vinegar, you can use citric acid, any food acid will work. I've even used orange juice, and wine, not together. <laughs> but it takes a lot of wine to make this into cheese, but it makes an amazingly unique cheese that you can use as a ricotta, uh, excuse me, ravioli filling. It turns purpley, kind of fun. And you'll need some salt, which we didn't bring today, and you will need uh, something to stir it with. A thermometer is useful, but we're gonna go without it today because you can tell when milk boils. <laughs> There's a step-by-step -step overview here, which I will repeat this slide at the end, so don't feel that you have to write it all down now, but I want to give you an idea of what we're going to do. We're going to heat the milk, and I'm going to talk about how at different temperatures, you will get a different result in your curd. We'll go over that several times. We're going to add the acid, we're going to let it set a little bit, then we're going to skim the curd, drain it, and for the paneer, we're going to press it. Okay, so now we're going to start heating our milk. This is a lovely induction burner, which should go nice and fast. Not even measuring today. You can do this by feel to a great degree. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people, it's always good to start with a recipe. So with cheese making, I like to remind people that recipes are just starting points. Depending on how you like your results, you can modify all of them. The question is, should it be whole milk or skim milk? It's completely up to you. The more fat that's in the milk, the creamier texture you'll get at the end. If you bought, have you purchased ricotta in the store, you'll see part skim, whole milk. I'm a big fan of whole milk. 
And of course, grocery store whole milk is not truly whole milk. It's standardized to about 3.5, 3.2% fat. The question is, does it matter how the milk is pasteurized? Yes, it does. Regular pasteurized milk um, will just say pasteurized milk on it, meaning it's been heated to usually no more than about 161. Although some uh, co cooperative packaging places are heating it to a higher temperature now, you do not want to use ultra high temperature or ultra pasteurized milk. And you typically will find those in organic milk, goat milk, um, milks that don't sell as quickly, unfortunately. You know, we'll all appreciate the day when organic milk sells faster and can be pasteurized at the lower temperature. Remember, when you're making this cheese, you're going beyond pasteurization temperatures, but you want to do that. You don't want it to have been done ahead of time. The question is about half and half or whole cream. Typically, you, well, you, first of all, if you use whole cream or half and half to make this, you're making more like a mascarpone. Everybody, anybody know that cheese? Which is more of a creamy, like a thick sour cream. So the amount of fat in the milk will dictate the final texture of the cheese or the culture, the product. Because I don't really, you know, mascarpone, hard to think of it as cheese, but it's great. So the amount of fat in the milk will just simply make it more and more creamy, less and less texture of a, you know, of a crumbly sort. So yeah, you can use it. Of course, a lot of, if you're buying it from the store, a lot of uh, whole uh, creams are ultra pasteurized. Read your ingredients. A lot of, too, a lot of products, creams and such have thickeners added and sugar added. So. The question is, is when you add the milk into the pot, can you add some heavy cream then? Sure. Again, it, no. I, you know, you could try it. Ultra pasteurization, the question is about ultra pasteurized. Ultra pasteurization really alters it. And typically those ultra pasteurized creams also have thickeners and sugars added. So just read the label. If you can find some that doesn't have anything added, it might work. Yes, you can, the question is, can you use skim milk? Any type of milk, any type of milk will do it, just with different textures. Remember, cheese is about coagulating the proteins and trapping the butter fat. If there's butter fat to trap, it'll be in there and it'll make it creamier. It's just gonna be that, just like that. So it just depends on the milk. If the milk has a different kind of protein in it, you might get a different texture. Again, getting into science. But you know, I always tell people too, no ma even if you uh, don't like science, if you make cheese, it's still happening. You're still, you're still, yeah, it's a big science, it's a science experiment. So I'm just checking to get up to temperature. When it gets to about 185, that's when we would coagulate it for a tender curd. Anywhere from 175 to 185, the lower the temperature, and I'll get your question in a second, the lower the temperature that you add the acid, this is very important, the lighter and more tender the curd will be. So if you want it chewier, like for paneer, you go hotter. Lower temperature, more tender, hotter, more chewy. Your question, ma'am? The question is about adding flavorings, and I will get to that a little bit later. You would add it after you are draining it. If you add, if you could add some things now, but you're gonna lose a lot of that in the whey, so you don't really wanna do, lose that. If there are some things you can't add later, like a liquid, like if you're wanting to add liquid smoke, or something like that, or a um, infusion of some sort of mushrooms that you'd simmered, you would add it now. But you can, eat, you can also add it later. All right, still not burning my finger. Well, I, I guess if I turn the temperature up, that would be helpful. You can go, so this, this type of heating, you can do on direct heat if you stir it constantly, or you can put the pot in another pot with water surrounding it, what we call a water bath, and heat it that way. You can get it that way to 185 or so, but if you wanna get it to a boil, you're going to have to take it out after it gets to its maximum, because it takes a really long time to boil milk, even on direct heat, compared to in a water bath. But the water bath makes it to where you can walk away, come back, you know, do some other errands in your kitchen, uh, and then come back. Now, if you're looking for an excuse to have somebody else do the dishes, do it on direct heat. I'm busy making cheese now, for all you other people. That's true. Well, this is an induction burner, and so I just now noticed I could turn it up to 10. 
You can do it. The question is about how hot to put it on there. Basically, as hot as you can continue to stir it without it scorching. If your pot is thin, you're going to need lower temperature because they won't transfer the heat around the milk easily. So just watch it. Stir it. If you feel like, I recommend stirring it with something rather flat so you can feel if it's starting to stick and then back off the temperature from that. Things like that. Just, just pay attention. But in general, the higher the temperature, if, if, if you put a whole gallon of milk in a regular uh, pot and put it on a gas stove, it's going to take about 20 minutes to come to a boil on high heat, unless you have a big uh, commercial burner. So, you know, it's still going to take a while. Any other questions right now? All right, so we're just waiting for it to get, yes? The question is, do you get more cheese or less cheese, what we call yield, depending on the type of milk and the amount of fat? Definitely. Um, and it depends more also about how much protein is in that milk of the right kind. Now, when we're heating up to this temperature of over 180, we're changing the way some of the proteins that would normally get lost in the way, or be lost in the way, how they behave, and capturing them in the cheese curd. It's called denaturing. So if anybody's been to a health food store, you've seen whey protein powder for bodybuilders or whatever. That is from cheese making. Uh, although actually now they can make so much money from the whey, some places simply take milk, curdle it, and capture the whey and sell that. So there's as much money in uh, whey as there is in cheese for the industrial cheese maker. But those proteins are lost in the way because they can't be captured in a regular cheese making curd. In this, where we're heating it to this high temperature, we're changing the way those whey proteins would behave and making them stick to the other. So we're getting a higher yield and a higher protein. Paneer, which I mentioned earlier, which we're going to make, which is an Indian cheese, Indian, Hindu population, lots of vegetarians, it becomes a really high protein, high quality product. I'm a vegetarian myself, so you know it's a great substitute for tofu if you don't want soy, or if you want to just make your own and don't want to make tofu. So, so the protein content and the fat content will change the yield, how much cheese you get. Okay. Um, the question is what kind of pan to use? That's an excellent question. Don't use aluminum. Aluminum should never make contact with anything that's acidic, and milk is acidic, slightly acidic, and then we're going to make it more acidic with the lemon juice. You could use enamel, but if you have any chips, watch out for that. Heavy-duty stainless is probably my best choice. Okay, so it's scalding hot now. Ouch. <laughs> the human thermometer says it's ready to add a light amount of acid. So if we were making the ricotta type now, I would turn this off add the lemon juice, and I'm going to show you, you'll see soon what that looks like when it's done, and then um, let it be. Because I want to show you the paneer style, because it's just to me the most wonderfully versatile cheese, and so surprising that you can make it from just these two ingredients, um, we're going to heat it hotter. The, the question is, what's the temperature for the ricotta? Anywhere between 175 and 185. I didn't see exactly who asked that. But. The paneer, you're going to take it up to almost a boil or a boil because we're going to get more protein, more texture. Paneer, once you refrigerate it for a day or so, it's sliceable for sandwiches. Like I said, you can um, fry it, you can bake it, you can put it in stews. It's just really nice to have around. And remember, cheese making is about preserving the milk harvest. You know, so if you have a lot of milk, if you have your own animals or access to a lot of good milk, you can uh, make some, a bunch of paneer, freeze it up, and have it through the winter. Was there a question back there? The question is, what proportion of acid? It's going to vary a little bit, but roughly with lemon juice, two thirds of a cup per gallon of milk. But I'm going to show you how to just add it until it's enough. Now, you know, hopefully I have enough. <laughs> yeah, you let, the, you let the milk and curd tell you when to stop adding. Because if you add too much, you're going to get it kind of break, broken apart and too tangy. All right, so now I'm going to turn it off. 
and start adding our acid. So I'm going to drizzle the acid over the top in small amounts and mix it in. This is lemon juice, which makes a great flavor. The acid choice is going to be about flavor. Can you see it start curdling there? So you want to slowly mix it in, give it a chance to curdle. The whey is already becoming translucent. So for those of you who can see it, it's kind of a yellowish clear now. And I'm going to stop adding, but stir a little bit just to see if it's going to keep, if it's going to stay like that. The question is about how, to, how much lemon juice. I started with about three quarters of a cup here, and then I just keep adding till it looks right. Of course, this isn't a whole gallon here. If the milk starts out already slightly more acidic, you're gonna need less. And sometimes lemons are more or less acidic. That's why I can't give you a solid measurement because it's going to vary. Learn to use your senses. All of us do that already with cooking. You know, um, you, if, if you, the recipe says to add a teaspoon of salt and you eat the dish and it's too salty, you don't next time add a teaspoon of salt. So do that with your cheese making too. Learn to let it tell you when it's done. Can most of you see that? Okay. Squeezed, yeah. The question is, is it commercial or reconstituted? That stuff will work, but that's the flavor you'll get too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, truly, as like I said, I used orange juice one time. You wouldn't believe the wonderful orange flavored curd I got. Took a lot of orange juice, and the whey was probably pretty tasty to drink as it was, because it would have been a lot of orange juice in that. So I'm, I'm gonna let it sit for 10 minutes, now, or a few minutes now. Question is, how do you know it's done? For those of you who can see it, you can see that it's pretty translucent. Pardon? Well, I can hold this part up, but that's not what's gonna tell you that it's done. The whey will tell you that it's done. When it becomes translucent, you've captured, you've curdled all the proteins and all the, that you can and trapped all the fat. That's why we wanna stop stirring now, because if we keep stirring, we're gonna maybe lose some of that fat out of this curd. So while we're letting it set, we're letting any of those um, curds that are, excuse me, those proteins that are still in there try to go ahead and stick into that curd. So then we're going to drain it. We're going to make this into paneer. So we're going to drain it for a few minutes in a colander lined with a cloth. You can use any type of cloth that's porous enough to let the way through, but keep the curd in. And that's true with all cheese making, yogurt making, anything. Use what works. This is a very fine, true cheesecloth. Um, I have been to several talks lately where cheesecloth was supplied and it's not good cheesecloth. Very open and gauzy. So you want it fairly fine or you're gonna lose some of this through it, especially if you try to press it. So we're gonna pretend that a few more minutes have passed here and ladle that out. Did somebody else have a question that I didn't? Yes. The question is, is if you had the salt, at what point would you add it? I'm going to show you that in a second here, but it'll be after it's drained. Again, remember, this works a lot of whey in there. On your best day, cheese making yield for this type of cheese is going to be about 20%, meaning if you had 10 gallons, you would get two gallons of curd. So you don't want to lose anything in the way that you want to keep in the cheese spices and flavorings. Might as well wait till most of the whey is gone, as long as you can mix it in then. So we're gonna ladle this curd out. We didn't even have a whole gallon here. The question is, is what would you do if this was ricotta? Same thing at this point. Ladle the curd out and only drain it for about five minutes to 10 minutes until you like the texture if you want your ricotta to be really firm, if you're gonna make those cheese balls, drain it for a little longer. If you want it to be soft, like you're gonna put it in a um, crepe or something, leave a little more whey in. That is up to you. And this, if this was ricotta curd, it wouldn't be so uh, textured looking. It would be much lighter and looser because we would have done an, added the acid at a lower temperature. Everybody remember that, right? No. Yeah, the term, the question is, what about farmer's cheese? Some of these terms mean whatever you want them to. 
There is no, in the United States, there is no, well, there is a small pantheon of legally named cheeses defined by the federal government. That if you make that cheese and go to sell it, it has to meet certain criteria. But the rest of it is all up to you. So, you know, this could be called farmer's cheese. I could make a pressed cheese and call it farmer's cheese. And that's where the term cottage, too, you know, made at home in the cottage. But most now, mostly now, and, the, and you know, by the same term, the term chevre, that means goat. It doesn't mean soft, fresh goat cheese. But when the, that cheese was first introduced to the U.S., it was called that because it was the fir Americans' first exposure to goat cheese. So now here in the States, we call it chevre, and they don't call it that anyplace else. So there was a question over here. The question is, is how long would I have let it set there if I had more time? Ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and it allows it to cool a little bit at that point, too. Leave it uncovered. So I'm going to set that aside. We have this draining. So this way is nice and clear. That's what you want. Now let it drain in here for about ten minutes. And that's when, after that point, I would mix the salt or herbs in. Yes? Does anything bad happen if it cools more in the way? The question is, is does anything bad happen if it cools more in the way? Nope. Yeah, so if you get busy at that point, you can leave it there for a while. Yeah, that's a good question. Any others right now? Yep. Is there any other use for that way? The question is, is there any other use for that way? Not very much for this way, other than put it on your compost. It doesn't have any proteins to speak of in because we captured them here. So it doesn't make a great feed for livestock. And it has no cultures in it, so it's not really useful as a probiotic or, a, you know, to get some more microbes in you. Um, it's acidic. So we use a way like this for, you know, putting, on, putting around berry plants, anything that's an acid lover. Just think of it as acidic water at this point. You know, it's been heated to a high temperature, so any vitamins that would have been in the milk they're still creating the color. The B vitamins, the riboflavin is creating this color, but they're not really active anymore. So it's not like a, a sweet way from making a cheese that's like a pressed like cheddar or something where it's gonna have some other nutrients in it. All right, so as it's cooling, you can turn it a little bit. See how it help it to uh, drain. All right, so now the fun part. We're going to tie it into a bundle. And here, there's a picture here of if it was ricotta curd. Now we're going to tie it in a bundle, making a lovely little knot called a Stilton knot. Stilton blue cheese is made using this technique to help drain the curds. It's a fantastic knot that um, you can use to press any cheese with. It's very useful for this. So you take your bundle. Now I, first I would have mixed the salt in. So let's do that. Sprinkle, sprinkle. And this can be to taste. Remember, you can always salt your cheeses afterward. A fresh cheese is not relying on salt for preservation. It's relying on it for flavor. So you could even use iodized salt in this. If you've done any cheese making, you know that always says use non-iodized salt. That's specifically for aged cheeses or cheeses where there are bacteria starter cultures. This has no starter culture. This is just an acidified milk. Question? Yes, this is now what I would add herbs to. Stir it, get the herbs mixed in evenly, and there'll be a picture later of one that has herbs added. Then you take three corners, one, two, three of your bundle, hold it down low, take the fourth corner, and start wrapping it around the bundle. You go one, you go around lower each time. So it's squeezing the way out. And by going around lower, it tightens itself and won't come loose. So then you get this little packet, I call it. And I'm going to set it on this bowl. Arrange the top. Is this on the camera? Arrange it on the top there, and then press it, and I think I'm going to use this. And I'm going to show you a picture of how I do it my high-tech way at home, which is... <laughs> so 
So I just set a plate, a saucer upside down at the bottom of the bowl, put the packet on that, another saucer inverted over the top of that, then whatever I'm going to use to put the weight on. Sometimes I use a cast iron skillet, whatever, it whatever I have around that's not being used for something else. It doesn't take a lot of weight. This curd is hot. It wants to stick back together, so you just want to press it into a tight shape. The tighter you press it, the less air pockets you'll have, so it'll be more sliceable, that sort of thing. And again, I can't tell you exactly how much, other than if it's too crumbly, put more weight on it the next time. You, know, you can still use it. You're always going to have a cheese that turns out. So at first, it's going to be really wobbly and want to fall over. So whatever you put on there, make sure if it does fall, doesn't take down everything else in your kitchen. And then I'm going to set this on top of that. And then I'm going to add a full gallon of weight once it fully stabilizes. There, we'll do that. And that's going to take about 45 minutes to press, but we'll open it up here at the end so you can see it. This is what it should look like at the end. So it'll have what they call a belly button of cheese from that knot pressing into it. This was with herbs, obviously. And it's going to be still a little crumbly until you chill it for about a day. So if you want the best texture for frying or putting in stews, chill it. You can cook it right away, but it is still going to want to break apart a little bit. The coldness will help the texture. Question? The question is what herbs, can you use fresh herbs? You can absolutely use fresh herbs. Whatever you want, it's good. That doesn't change when you add it to the hot curd. You know, sometimes when you add some fresh herbs to heat, like basil, they just, they lose everything and just don't become very pretty or tasty. So yeah, any type of herb will work. Cause this is going to be refrigerated for storage. So fresh herbs are good. The question is about when you refrigerate it. Unwrap it, and that's on the steps too, I'll tell you, I think. Unwrap it, wrap it in, put it in a plastic bag or in a tub, put it in the fridge. Yeah, there, if, you, if you chill it in the cheesecloth, the cheese is just gonna get stuck in the cheesecloth and you may never get it clean. There was a question here first, no. Um, does it matter what kind of oil that you're gonna fry in later? The question is, is what kind of oils to fry it in? Whatever your heart desires. Butter, you can, yeah. And then I'll get. Can you freeze? Yes, freezing. I mentioned earlier, we freeze up a bunch of this, and then um, our interns, who are always hungry, can just pull it out and eat it. This one. And then. When again did you, did you add the salt, and what's the technique for adding salt? Just stir the salt. The question is about adding the salt. Add stir in the salt after it's drained, before it's refrigerated or pressed. Uh, you know what? I should do some research on alternative milks. The question is, can you do it with nut milk? Um, in my yogurt class, I had about coconut milk, and I um, I should preface all my talks with I'm a I'm a dairy person. I raise and milk cows, and um, I'm not against alternative milks, but I have no knowledge of how to use them. And uh, just to let you know that there are often some classes at Mother Earth News Fairs about making tofu and using almond milk to make things. But I, it is not in my skill set. Um, when you're pressing it, does more liquid come out into the bowl? The question is, when you're pressing it, does more liquid come out into the bowl? A little bit. So should we do it in a colander sitting in the bowl? Um, no, the question about doing it in a colander, then you'll kind of, it'll press through the colander holes. So you can do that, but it does, you better, it's hard to peel it out. There was a question number, let's do this one. That's cute. The question is using a modified wine press. You don't need it for this, but you could. You could also use a cheese press. It doesn't require much pressure, but use it. Yeah. There's a picture in my book of me, not me, but my cheese. I made a 22 pound cheddar, which usually takes a mechanical press. Don't have, I don't have a mechanical press. So I set it on a table with another with a thing over the top of it and used a big truck ratcheting strap. It worked. It's not about what you use, it's, it's, it doesn't do the job. And I know I'm, you've seen a lot of hands and I apologize if I'm not getting you in, in order. 
The question is, can you use kefir as an acid? Yes, you can. You can use kefir, which is a fermented milk, buttermilk, um, but they are going to be weaker acids and may require a lot more. But you, there's a recipe called buttermilk cheese, which is adding the buttermilk and then acidifying it. You start thinking, just tell, remind yourself, it's not about what, it's about if it's acidic and then how much do you need. If you can eat that acid, you can use it to help make a curd. That's just the science of what happens. This stuff curdles if it's hot and acidic. We could add the lemon juice earlier and start heating it and it would curdle at a lower temperature. As soon as those two points converge of the right amount of acid and the right temperature, it will curdle. And that is a fun, a fun science. Let me just go finish going over the slide really quick because I will, I'm sure, have some time at the end for lots of questions, I think. Okay, so citric acid, which you may have on hand for doing quick mozzarella. Two teaspoons of that dissolved in some cool water will work. Um, any type of vinegar, balsamic makes a very funny colored cheese, but it works. And then buttermilk, which is, would be like the kefir. All right, so here are some little options for other things you can do when it's done. You'll see some recipes that always tell you to add baking soda at the end. That's completely optional, and the only reason it's done is to neutralize the acid. So if you need a certain amount of acid to curdle it, but you don't like that acidic results, you can add a little bit of baking soda. I, don't, I never do it, but I want to tell you why, because it's in a lot of recipes, and I don't even know if they know why. but. You can add cream to the soft ricotta, not to the paneer, after it's done to change the texture. And then changing, always remember to change the temp temperature to change the texture. The lower the temperature, the t more tender the curd will be. Okay, so let's unwrap this and see what it looks like. We still have a few minute, good minutes left too. Okay, so. I've got our little bundle. You can see it's pressed out. Not much cheese from this little half gallon, but it's going to still be cute. Got cheese. Take a bow, cheese. And look, it has a lemon seed in it. <laughs> so I'm going to bring this down so you guys can all feel it. I want you to feel what we made in such a brief time with such a small amount of milk. And I'll bring the whey down too. Thank you.